amen to that song. You know, the, the, uh, the victory is where? In Jesus, right? And so that's kind of in line with the message today, still dealing with being in Christ and being baptized in Christ. And so the basis, again, as it was last week, is going to be based out of Romans chapter 6. And we'll, we'll reread a few verses there uh, to refresh ourselves. Um, <clears throat> and I think uh, many of you were here last week, but that was even kind of building off of the concept of baptism. Because I was, for a couple of weeks, I dealt with the issue of baptism and our baptism into Christ. And that's not accomplished by water, but that is a full identification with Christ. And so that's what the word baptism means. It means to identify, to fully identify with something. And so there's different baptisms in the Bible. And the purpose of a baptism is to identify with something. And so being baptized into Christ, we are fully identifying with Christ, but it's not just about anything with Christ. We're not fully identifying, um, you know, in his earthly ministry with his rebukes of the Pharisees or his rebukes of the Sadducees. And, and there's different aspects of his ministry that we don't, we should not participate in. But we are, Romans chapter 6 says, we are fully identified in His death, burial, and resurrection. That's the important uh, aspect of it. So um, the, the reason that that is important, and obviously we can go in a lot of different ways with this, but the number one issue is that God created man with a plan and a purpose for man. And man failed from the very beginning. And so no one has been able to live up to the God-ordained purpose and function that God desired for man. What's it, the Scripture says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God designed man to reflect His glory, to be a, a creation that would bring God glory. And every man has failed except one. There is one man who has earned the right, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. And so all the, the, the things that God has for man to inherit, all the, the, the God-ordained purpose and the glory that God desires for man is all wrapped up in that one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why if we want to honor God, we must be identified with that one man. There is no other option. You cannot give God glory apart from that one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's why this issue of baptism, being identified with Him, is so important. <clears throat> and it's not just... Um, it's not just on how we view it, but it's how God reckons it. God is accounting us as having died with Christ, being buried with Christ, and raised again with Christ. That's far. Now, it's important for us to, to learn and to grow in our knowledge and understanding of this thing because it does impact how we live. But it's far more important that God sees it that way than that you and I see it this way. We just see dimly. We're, we're trying to wrap our mind around some of this, but God sees it this way, and that's what's so wonderful. That's what's um, so secure. So let's read a few verses here in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, 
that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we're going to kind of, I left the chart on the, on the board today that we dealt with last week to kind of refresh our, uh, our memory and our understanding. Because if you remember, we went back to Romans chapter 5. In fact, you can look back there. Um, and I believe it's... Uh, I'm trying to remember which verse it is. Verse 14. It says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. And then if we drop down on to uh, verse 21, it says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we think about the reign of sin and death, ever since the, the creation or the fall of Adam, we talked about that, that reign, that dominion, that King Sin had and King Death had. And, and how effective was that reign? It was absolute, wasn't it? It's like a dictator. It is a harsh, unbending, unyielding, powerful ruler that dominates, that has dominion over humanity. King Sin and King Death reigned supreme. And that's where we all found ourselves, in subjection to sin and death. And by the way, Romans chapter 5 says that it's not just, be, not just our fault. In other words, a newborn baby can die having never sinned, but they're still under the reign of death. They can't escape it through no fault of their own. We're born in that dominion. We're born under that realm. And yet, Christ came and He conquered sin and death. He never yielded to King Sin, and he, he willingly, even though King Death had no power over him, because sin and death must go together to have power. And because he never once sinned, he willingly yielded himself to death for our sake, but death had no power, and so he rose from the grave victorious. And therefore, we can now be set free because now we are under the reign of grace. Verse 21 there in, verse, in chapter 5 says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So now we're looking at we have those of humanity who have been placed into Christ identified with Christ, are now identified with His death, burial, and resurrection, and we're resurrected into the reign and dominion of grace. Now, even as powerful as sin and death have been, and they've had dominion, dominion is absolute control and rule, and they've reigned, that means they've been supreme. Grace has come along and annihilated it. Grace hasn't just been an equal force to balance it out. Grace has annihilated sin and death for the believer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace is much superior to the reign of sin and death. Now, that's important because we're going to we're going to think about that, the superiority of grace, as we go along in this message. <clears throat> so we are no longer under the dominion of, of sin and death. Now, and God is dealing with the believer on the basis of grace. And yet, 
I have found, maybe you have too, I have found many people are scared of grace. And typically it's religious people who have, it's those in the Christian world who are scared of grace. Typically it's not so much the unbeliever that's unchurched. It's more the churched people who are scared of grace. Isn't that fascinating? And that's no different in, in, in reality. Jesus, in His earthly ministry, full of grace and truth, even though it wasn't the exact same as what we now understand through the Apostle Paul's ministry, He was still full of grace and truth. And do you realize the sinners and the, the harlots and the tax collectors they came to Him and were attracted to Him, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers hated Him, and many of the chief priests. The religious people rejected Him. Isn't that interesting? Religiously minded people have always had trouble with grace. And you'll find the greatest opposition to grace in Christian religious circles. And that's a sad reality, but it's, it's, it's nothing new. It's nothing new. And I've encountered um, some, perhaps many, I don't know how many, but I can think of some very specific examples of even Bible teachers, church leaders, and pastors who are scared of grace, so they teach being in Christ as a work. It's not an identification of God declaring what you are, but it's something you do. And, and you have to live a certain way to abide in Christ. And if you're living godly, you're in Christ. If you're not living godly, you're in the flesh, and you need to get back in Christ. And so it's more of a day-by-day -day situation. And I, that's not an uncommon teaching, sadly. And uh, I think there's a problem with that. This chapter, rightly understood, absolutely refutes that. And, and Paul's teaching on being in Christ refutes that idea that it's something we do or merit based on how we live life. <clears throat> and then there's others scared of grace because they think, well, if you promote grace, then that's just promoting more sin, right? Because in, in, in a religious mind, to, to legalistically set standards and boundaries will do more to curb sin than grace can. And yet that is absolutely false. And Paul deals with that in the very first question of this chapter, verse 1. Because you see, when, when somebody first encounters grace, verse 1 is a good question. But as you grow and mature in grace, as you understand grace, you realize it's an ignorant question. Look at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because back in chapter 5, he said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so the logical, as you're reasoning through this for the first time, the logical question is, well, okay, if my sin abounds... And when it abounds, grace much more abounds. Why not continue sinning so you see a continuing abounding of grace? What's the problem with that? Because Paul immediately says, God forbid. So Paul's not condoning that attitude at all. But what is the problem with that thinking? Number one is, that is assuming that sin is the cause of grace. And that's not true. Sin is the problem. God is offering grace. Sin does not cause grace. God offers grace as a solution out of the goodness of His heart. But sin, sin would naturally solicit judgment. God, sin is not the cause of grace. God is out of the goodness of His heart. So just because you sin more does not mean more grace. It means that God saw the abounding sin of humanity and He declared His grace 
much more than enough to deal with the sin issue. So here's, here's another way to look at this. As we, as, well, first of all, you cannot out the grace of God because it superabounds. So you cannot out the grace of God. Um, and all of the grace of God is available to you the moment you get saved. And a sinner can be a big-time sinner, and when they come to the Lord, they get all of God's grace. <clears throat> but a believer cannot get more of God's grace by sinning more. See, that's the, the fallacy of the, the, the question there in verse 1. A believer doesn't get more of God's grace by sinning more. And the reason is because a believer no longer lives in the realm of sin and death. You see, that's where the abounding grace of God was exposed. As, as people wholesale went into the, to the, the rulership of sin and death, and sin and death just grew more powerful, and the rebellion against God seemed to be stronger, even to the death of His chosen man, the Lord Jesus Christ, sin had abounded to new heights at that top point in history. And yet through that, God showed a more abounding grace. The grace abounded in light of horrible sin and death reign. But now, as a believer, as we have been moved into the reign of grace, we have all of God's grace at our disposal. And for us to sin more over here under this reign and dominion does not bring more grace. All of the grace is sufficient from day one. And so it is only a, a religious or a carnal mindset that would think that me as a believer can sin more and get more grace. That's not how it works. An unbeliever can commit horrible sins and horrible sins and they can come to the Lord and they can have abundant grace to more than deal with what they've been through. But you and I have that already. And we don't need more of it. There is no more for God to give. And so... Sin has its own consequences. You know, God is not dealing with the believer now over here. The reason you don't get more grace is because as a believer, He's not dealing with you on the basis of sin. Do you know every person, unsaved person in humanity, God is dealing with them on the basis of sin and death. He's going to deal, Their sin is determining their destiny. Their death is their separation from God and a sign of them coming short of the glory of God, and God's going to deal with them on that basis. But for you and I today, who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, He is not dealing with us on that basis. That's why He doesn't just keep abounding grace when you try to abound your sin. Because He's not dealing with you on the basis of your sin. Now that doesn't mean there's still, you know, some go the other way and say, well, okay, Cast off restraint. Live licentiousness. And that's foolish too. Why? Because sin is always destructive. Always. It might be a little sin and it might be less destructive and you might think you can get by with it for a time, but, but it's always destructive at some level. Either to you or to those around you. And that's why, it's, that's why it's sin. It's falling short of the glory of God. It's not God's design. It's not how God wants the world to function. So sin is, is important for the believer, but not to get more of God's grace. Now, and another factor in that too, sin, God does not shield us from sin's consequences. Just because God is not going to condemn us for hell 
to hell for our sin because we are in Christ does not mean that God is shielding us from the sin. So, you know, it's, it's foolishness to think, well, I can just go sin and grace will more abound, right? Because, okay, let's put that in logical perspective. Let's say there's a, a, an ill-tempered man who is abusive to his wife and children. And he gets a hold of this grace thing and he thinks, oh, well, okay, if sin causes grace to abound, I'll just keep on. Well, think about the destructive end that that will be if a man keeps abusing his wife and children. It's not going to turn out that man may be saved because maybe he's trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's not going to end well in this life and he's going to lose reward at the judgment seat of Christ. He will be ashamed. Or the alcoholic to just live in a drunken state the grace of God is great enough that that drunkard can still be saved because he's in Christ. But the consequences of his sin will be rampant. So this, Paul is never endorsing the believer to continue in sin, to continue sinning in our flesh. And so he will deal with that later in this chapter about the sin in our mortal bodies. But that is a different issue as we live out life and we sin in these mortal bodies. That is a different issue than what we're dealing with here. We're talking now about living which realm are we in and how is God dealing with us. We're not in the realm of sin and God's not dealing with us on the basis of sin. God is dealing with us on the basis of grace because we're in Christ Jesus. There's a verse you don't need to turn there in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. <clears throat> and probably a very familiar uh, verse to us. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us. So the grace of God is teaching us. See, the grace of God is not licentiousness. It's not a, it's not a blanket a blank check to sin as much as you want. The grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly pleasure, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. That's what the grace teaches us. See, the grace teaches us that sin and death were reigning supreme. We had no answer. We had no solution. And Christ died a death that we should have died, took a penalty of sin that we should have taken to free us from it. And He offers us to, to, it to us freely. It took extreme measures for God to give this grace. So therefore, that should tell us how valuable grace is. And we should not take it lightly. We should not abuse it. Now, is it? That's a question. Can grace be abused? Absolutely. That's the nature of grace. So it can be abused. But a proper understanding of it will lead you to honor the Lord, not abuse the grace. <clears throat> now, if you want to turn over to Galatians chapter 2, and, and this is Galatians 2.20 is another familiar verse, and you kind of hold your place. We'll come back to Romans chapter 6. And in fact, there's two verses, a verse in Romans chapter 6 and a, and a verse here in Galatians 2.20 that I want us to compare a little bit. Galatians 2.20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And first of all, I might, just, I might just point out, this is one of the strongest passages of a personal issue. Do you realize what Paul says? He doesn't say Christ loved the church. That is true. He says that in some places. He doesn't say that, he, that Christ died for the believers. You know what he says? He says, Christ loved me. 
And he died for me. And do you realize that if you, each one of us could put ourselves in that place, if we were the only sinner in the world, Christ would have died for you. Or you. Or me. That's, it's personal. That's what each one of us mean to Christ. And Paul, and how do we know that? Well, because Paul was the epitome of rebellion against God. Paul was the, you know, Saul of Tarsus was on a holy rampage against Christ. And he came to the realization that if Christ died for him to save him, absolutely he died for every one of us personally. And so that's a very powerful uh, thought from this verse. But look at the, the beginning of this verse. I lost my place here. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Now, why, why does it say that present tense? In fact, I, I think there's other versions of, of the Bible that do say, what, why not say I have been crucified with Christ? And, and the comparing verse back here in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, it says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Why does it say that in present tense instead of past tense? Because I've wrestled with that before. It's like, well, once I get saved, isn't all that a past tense deal? I have been crucified. I was crucified with Christ. He was crucified once. And so I remember thinking, okay, does this mean that because some people teach us you need to die daily. You know, you need to crucify your flesh and your old man every day. And you've got you to wake up and you've got to conquer that old man and put him to death. And I, I can tell you that's a defeated way to live. But it says this present tense to eliminate that very idea. Because if it was, a one, if it was in the past, I have been crucified with Christ or I was crucified with Christ, people might get the idea that I need to do it again. It needs to be repeated. But when it's present tense, it's an abiding reality that never changes. It's not something that we can repeat. It's something that exists. I am crucified with Christ. It's not a work that I did. It's something that God reckons to me. And it's something that exists every moment for the believer. It's God's reality, God's perspective. That's the idea of being baptized into His death, His burial, and His resurrection. I am crucified. My old man is crucified. And that does not change. You can read that verse every day, and every day that verse is true. It never changes. There's nothing for you to repeat. There's nothing for you to redo. And that's why I believe it's a a present tense, an abiding reality. Now, this brings security to our relationship with Christ. And that is an important, in fact, that is a vitally important concept. And I think that's one of the concepts of of grace that we can overlook. The idea of security. And and we think about the, um, the issue of love. You know, God is love. God desires love. God wants His believers to love one another. And we know that love is a central issue with God. And yet, what we learn is that true love can only flourish where there's peace and security. So let's think about this in a practical setting. Why do people get married? Why did did God design it that children 
be brought up by a married couple if at all possible. Why not date and just date and randomly, you know, live however you want to live? Why marriage? Because marriage is intended to bring security. And that's where true love can flourish. Now, let's think about that even in the concept of marriage because let's just suppose that a man and a woman draw up a lengthy contract. In fact, I'm basing this off of a real-life event. I know of a couple that lives this way. Before they were married, they, they made lengthy contracts that each one of them signed. And I don't know what's in that contract specifically. But I will say that I, I don't know about the occupation of both of them. At least one of them is a lawyer. So maybe it comes natural. But what I've observed, they have a nice family. They have a large family. And, you know, you could, you, I can only imagine, you know, in the contract, the, the, the man is going to uh, have a full-time job. The wife is going to have a part-time job. The man is going to be responsible for uh, maybe putting the kids down at, at night to bed. The woman's able to get them rise in the morning and get them going for the day. The woman is in charge of their schooling. The man is in charge of their sporting activities. Uh, the man is in charge of the, the house cleaning. The woman will cook the food. Uh, you know, the list could go on and on. And I, as I observe that family and even this example, that can provide a, a seemingly very functional family life that's structured Everything gets done. It runs like clockwork. But that does not necessarily foster love. Now think about that. That's, it's okay to have those discussions and share those responsibilities or whatever. But that a couple in that situation has bound themselves legally to fulfill their obligations. And there may be a fear of a lawsuit or a fear of of divorce or whatever if they can't continually measure up to their side of the contract. And so subtly, fear becomes a primary motivation. One, you know, one of, the, one of the spouse's struggles, maybe, maybe they're dealing with depression or stress in life, or maybe one of them is sick and has cancer, or maybe you name it, there's there's physical problems, emotional problems. Life sends a lot of curveballs. And if it's not covered in the contract, there's that little nagging fear. How's the other person going to respond? How am I going to be dealt with? But you know, as a couple learns to be motivated by grace, instead of instead of everything detailed and outlined of what their obligation is and what their obligation is, they learn to, by love, serve one another. And when they do it by freedom of choice, instead of some prior obligation, then it is authentic. Then it becomes more of an expression of love when they serve one another for the good of the family or for the good of the marriage instead of just an obligation. So hopefully we can start seeing that in our mind, and, and that's the difference between law and grace. When God gave the law, He says, you do certain things and you're going to be cursed. But if you do well, you'll be blessed. And, and that is a motivator, but it's not the best motivator. Along comes grace and it says, you deserve nothing. Nothing. But I will give you everything. Now, we have a responsibility. We can, we can ignore it, live how we want to live, and dishonor that, or we can make the choice out of no pressure, no fear, 
we can make the choice, I'm going to dedicate my life for the Lord as best I can because I value what He has given me. And that's motivated by grace and that is a true expression of love. You see, that is a higher expression of love than can be accomplished legally or under a law-based or a fear-based system. It's a higher expression. And that's what God is after. God's not forcing you, when you live under grace, He's not forcing you to meet certain requirements in order to have that grace. He's given you all the grace and it's up to us to respond. And when we do respond in a way pleasing to God, it is like saying, thank you, Lord. And God values that. God is honored by that when we respond positively to His grace. That's where true love, true devotion... You see, the highest form of worship... Think about this the highest form of worship comes under grace because of the freedom that we have to make the choices however we decide. <clears throat> and as I said, can grace be abused? Absolutely it can. But that's why it's important to understand what we have in Christ, who we are in Christ, and to respond accordingly. <clears throat> now, we have been made alive with Christ. Remember th that song, Victory in Jesus. And it's not apart from Him. It's not outside of Him. And it's not our victory. It's not our life. It's His life, His victory, it's His death, His burial, His resurrected life. And so that's important to understand. Now we've got, so what my point is, everything that we have, everything relating to the grace of God, um, His purpose to, to, for man to live to His glory, everything that we're looking forward to in eternity, everything that we hope for, it's all in Christ. It's in that one man. All, in fact, there, I, I can't think of the song, but it, I think it's all Hail the Long Expected Jesus. And I can't remember the rest, but there's a, a line in there, I think it's that song, that talks about everything being wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of God's hopes and dreams are in that one man. <clears throat> Now, I want to do a little, uh, a little exercise here in Ephesians chapter 1. If you all, I want you all to turn there, if you've got a Bible, to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're thinking about this, um, this issue of being in Christ and God's purpose in Christ and all that we have in Christ and this, there, is, there is so much more, but this is just a small passage that we're going to go through. And I want us to look for the phrases, in Him, in whom, in Christ, in the Beloved, any of those phrases where it's talking about us being in Christ or God's purpose being fulfilled in Christ and 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 how that impacts us. And, and so I want us to just focus on those phrases as we go through this. In fact, Barry, you've got a pen. Do you want to count for us as we go through verse by verse? We're going to start in verse 3. And, and Barry's going to count how many times that we've got in Christ, in the Beloved, in whom, and, and, and those things, or maybe even with Christ. I can't remember if that's one of these or not. But we'll start in verse 3. So we'll, we'll look at them together. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, where? In Christ. So there's one right there. There's one. In Christ. That's where 
the all spiritual blessings are. They're not outside of Christ. They're in Christ. Verse 4. So we've got one. Verse 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him. There's another one. He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Now, this verse is not... The, the Calvinists view it wrongly. They read this as God chose us before the foundation of the world to be in Christ. That's not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying that God chose from the foundation of the world that all of this would be in Christ, all of this would be available to believers in Christ. So God, had, God did not choose us to salvation or appoint us to salvation and appoint other people to damnation. God doesn't do that. He doesn't appoint some to be saved and some to be lost. What He does is He appoints that everything is, all the good things for the believer are only available in Christ. That's what He decided before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> and so He chose that the believer would be in Christ. Now verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the pleasure of His good or to the good pleasure of His will. So He's predestinated us. That means the destination is already set. So everybody in Christ already has a set destination. If you're in Christ, your destination is the adoption of children, to be adopted into God's family. Verse 6, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted, where? In the Beloved. So there's another one. In the Beloved. Where are we accepted before God? We're not accepted in our flesh. We're not accepted in our own being. We are accepted in Christ. So as we think about all these things, as we continue to go on, and we see realize being baptized into Christ for God to identify us with Christ is absolutely important because in Christ is where everything is at. So He has made us accepted in the Beloved. That's Christ. Verse 7, In whom we have redemption. Okay, there's another one. In whom? That's in Christ. We have redemption through His blood. See, we don't have redemption apart from being in Christ. It's only in Christ. Even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. And I always love that phrase. The forgiveness of our sins is not just enough to barely cover, just to sneak us in, just to get us by. The forgiveness of our sins is according to the riches. It's the, the magnificent abundance of His grace. Verse 8, Wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to the, His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself. So there's another one. All the, the, the purpose of God is in Christ. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. So it, it reiterates the phrase several times, but it's essentially uh, one, one point here, one message that God is in, God's intent is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, everything, everything that remains of heaven and earth would be in Christ. And that's where everything would operate, in Christ. Verse 11, in whom, so there it is again, in Christ also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him that worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. So our inheritance 
is in Christ. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. So that, this, is a little, this is not necessarily speaking of a positional term, but just our trust in Christ. Now verse 13, in whom? There's another one. In whom, in Christ, ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, and there it is again, in Christ, also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So we were sealed into Christ. Indicating it is a permanent reality. <clears throat> Now, as we think about this, being in Christ is a big deal, isn't it? We've just been through a few passages, or a few verses, in one small portion of the book of Ephesians, among the 13 books that the Apostle Paul wrote, and we've already counted, how many times did you come up with, Barry? Nine. And these 10 verses or so, we have come up with nine times where it re-emphasizes the issue of in Christ, in the Beloved, in Him, in whom. It's a big deal, isn't it? Because see, the point is, it's not about us. It's about Christ. He is the man the Lord from heaven. He is the man Christ Jesus. He is the Son of Man, the Son of God. He is the, the, the capstone, the cornerstone. He is the perfect example, the perfect person that God wants man to be. And you and I have no hope of being that man but through His grace, He has allowed you and I to be fully identified with that man. And that's hard to wrap our mind around grace like that. Everything that Christ inherits, He is sharing with you and I. Everything that He has accomplished, He is letting us enjoy the accomplishments of that. As we think about the glorious future, when, when eventually sin and death are put, uh, put to final rest, it will be a completely glorious existence all because of the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. And you and I as believers, when we trust the gospel of our salvation, we, and it says right here, that after we believe, we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We are sealed into Christ. And that is an amazing truth. You see, that permanence, that security, is where true love, the expression of true worship, can flourish. You know, we can go to uh, many random churches around the, the countryside, and if they're preaching a legalistic Christ, a legalistic salvation, and a legalistic work for you to stay in Christ, that is not true worship. It's missing the mark. And it's, it promotes self-righteousness, and it still falls short of the glory of God, which is sin. The only way for us to bring glory to God is to magnify what Christ has done and to be in Him. And the gospel magnifies the work and person of Christ. That you trust in what Christ does. You, you trust, you honor what Christ did on the cross, and you trust that as enough for your standing with God. And you trust His righteousness, not your own. By the way, your own if you're trusting in your own righteousness, that absolutely will bring insecurity to your life. And it should. 
But when you trust in what Christ has done, that brings security. And then you honor that, and, and that brings true worship. And as we live life for Christ, not out of fear, but we live a dedicated life to Him, that brings honor to God. And that is a, an expression of true love. Now, we can see that that's, that's, that's a big deal. So let's go back to Romans chapter 6, and we'll try to understand a few more verses here. In Romans chapter 6, before we close. <clears throat> Notice that in verse 2, this is kind of re, uh, just kind of reaffirming what we've already taught a little bit. But verse 2, his answer to, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And I talk about we're no longer on this side. We're not under the dominion or the reign of sin and death. And so therefore we can't sin more to get more grace because God's not dealing with us on the basis of our sin anymore. But he says, verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. So we're identified with His death. We're identified with His burial, which is a putting away of the sin. And we're also identified with Christ's resurrection that we should also walk in newness of life. Now verse 5 says that we have been planted together in the likeness of His death. Why do you think it uses the word planted? That's kind of an interesting term, isn't it? And you know, it's, it's not... It's not different than a seed. A seed is planted, right? But what, what stage of life is a seed in when you go to plant it? It's dead. A seed is dead. But you plant it, and what comes forth? Does, does the seed pop out of the ground? It doesn't. Something entirely new comes out of the ground. So that's the picture here of being planted with Christ and being raised again. We should walk in that newness of life even though we haven't seen with our eyes. See, we walk by faith, not by sight. We have yet to see the, the totality of what that means because we still walk around in this mortal body. But in this mortal body, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling. We have, the, we have eternal life in Christ. And we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And we're to walk in that reality, in that newness of life. <clears throat> because at verse 5 it says, We shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. See, that's still yet future, the totality of that. We should walk in newness of life now, based on who we are in Christ. But the, the real final fulfillment of that is when we get our resurrected body. <clears throat> Verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. See, we are freed from sin because we're no long, God's no longer dealing with us on that basis. But that is the reason why we should not sin. Now, that may sound like a contradiction, but th that is the motivation of why we should not sin. Well, let's read on. For if we be dead with Christ, we believe, believe we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over Him. For in that He died, He died unto sin once, but in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. See, death had dominion over Christ for a short time, but it, no more. This says no more. And notice in verse uh, 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. See, sin no longer has dominion over us because we're not on, under its reign. We're under the reign of grace. Now, that's not saying that you don't deal with sin. And as I pointed out last week, a person can be addicted to, let's say, alcohol or drugs, and living in a sinful addiction that seems to have dominion over them. 
And the way we reconcile that with these verses is that person is still under the reign of grace. And God is not dealing with them on the basis of that sin. However, because they are under grace, look what it says. We'll read verse 11 and 12. It says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, here's how we should respond. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Do you see the difference now? We as a person and how God sees us and how we exist in God's reality is not in the reign of sin and death. In God's reality, we're under grace. And because of that, in these mortal bodies, we shouldn't let sin reign there either. You see how that's different? We as a believer can let sin reign in our mortal body by living according to the dictates of the flesh. But that's doing that over here on the grace side. So it's dealing with two different issues here in Romans chapter 6. One is our position and we're not under the dominion of sin. We're under the reign of grace. But the second issue is you still have a mortal body and you shouldn't let sin reign in it because you are under grace. So you see how the, the one is intended to motivate the other. But, but in doing that, you have freedom. So there's not this fear that, oh, I messed up and, and, and I'm, you know, God's angry with me. God's going to judge me. God, oh no, bad things might happen to my family because God is upset with me. That's not the reality that we live in. So that brings a little bit of, or a lot of security and peace. So now, as we think about that, let's just imagine how this might look. As we, as we deal with our challenges in life, and 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 maybe we go through something rough or we have committed something that's pretty egregious and, and we're ashamed about it. With this, understanding this concept, understanding this reality, how should we approach God with that? Because you know what, you know what happens to a lot of Christians? Immediately when they do something bad, and I've been here too, I want to run from God. I don't want to deal with it. I want to hide. And I, I don't want to pray about it. I don't want to acknowledge it for a while, maybe. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed about it. But you know what we should do? We should come to the Lord. Lord, you know, I, I did this thing, and I'm so embarrassed. And I, it was the wrong thing. And, and, and you know what the Lord, and I'm not saying the Lord audibly talks to us, but based on our knowledge of Scripture, sometimes we have conversations, I do, in my head, and the Lord is talking to me based on the knowledge of the Scripture, not an audible voice. But the Lord's response is going to be like, I know you did the wrong thing. I knew you were going to do it before you did it. It didn't take me by surprise. And you're like, yeah, man, I just, I want to make it right. And, you know, I've messed up. And you know what? Some things you can't make right. And the Lord would be like, it's, it's, it's going to be okay. You might have some earthly consequences you have to deal with, but you're in the beloved. And you can't, what you do does not change my love for you. And you see, that would be the biblical response of the Lord in those situations. And so as, and the Lord could be like, you know, as you struggle with those things, you just need to come to me more often. And you'll find that maybe life will go a little bit better and, and smoother. And you just need to continue to grow in grace. And, and maybe you'll learn from this experience and be stronger because of it. Maybe you can help other people who are struggling through this. And you'll be like, thank you, Lord. You know, I, I know that, but that's not my natural thought process. Thank you, Lord. And you can walk away refreshed. Just a little conversation with the Lord, but you, you must have that conversation based on the knowledge of Scripture. But you see how the, the Lord's grace is sufficient 
for whatever you're going through and for whatever you will go through. And so our natural response should not be to run from the Lord. And, and that's, why, that's why it's sad, but when people get caught up in sin, sometimes that's embarrassing, like public issues, they quit going to church. And it's because of shame, but do you realize that's the wrong response? When, when someone is caught publicly, they deal with their own shame. We don't need to heap shame on them. We can encourage them to move on and to, and to live right and to live a God-honoring life, and we should encourage them in that endeavor, but we don't need to heap shame on them. They already have the shame because God doesn't heap the shame on them. And, and so that should be our basis as well. So that's just a little example of, of how we should think about the Lord under grace and how we should think about our sin. Now, in closing, I'll, I'll look at one verse or a couple verses in Ephesians chapter 2. We think about this, this grace of God that is so rich and so deep and so powerful and it's so hard to get our minds wrapped around. And would we really... You know, some of us can be kind of conceited and some of us are confident. Some of us are a little more timid. Some of us are a little more uh, prone to negativity maybe. But no matter where we find ourselves, if we truly examine who we are at the core, it's not very good. You know, apart, I have not been exposed to near the amount of, you know, depravity that some people have been in their human existence. I've lived a pretty sheltered life. But if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ, in my life, and not only that, but even before I was saved, if it wasn't for that, His influence through the people around me, protecting me, I could have been Adolf Hitler. And you could have too. Because it's just one... Adolf Hitler was not born this evil, nasty, God-hating killer at two or four years old. It's just people become that little by little by little, by little. And every one of us has that capability. And that's sobering. And that brings us back to the magnificence of the grace of God that He loved me and gave Himself for me. Now, these verses in, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we'll, we'll start in verse 4. The, just the richness of this passage is is. It just blows my mind. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened. That means to be, He made us alive. He made us alive together with Christ. And that's the title of the message, Alive with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together. Notice that. With Christ, together with Christ, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now notice this verse, verse 7. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And I think we're, we are studying this. We're, we're working hard to get our mind wrapped around this. This great love. This great mercy. This great grace. And, and we're rejoicing in it to the best of our ability. And this verse says that in the ages to come, that's yet future. 
He's going to show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. There is far more yet to come that we can't even scratch. We're just scratching the surface of the grace of God. There's more to come. All we can do is say thank you, Lord. Because we can't even, we don't even know what all that entails. But the grace of God is reigning supreme. It has annihilated sin and death. And that's the reign, that's the dominion that we live in. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your great grace. And Father, we, in our small way, try to understand it. And we, re- we do absolutely rejoice that your grace abounds and that it is reigning today through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, Father, we do pray that we might grow in this understanding and, and allow that security to cause us to respond in love. Father, we pray that we can, we can uh, have an answer and a hope within us to share to those around us who are seeking And Father, we rejoice in all that we have in Christ, and we know that it's more than we can understand. And so we pray this on the merits of Christ and for His glory. Amen.